So you can imagine having been all, all of my life in very good, well-earning position, suddenly fighting tooth and nail for my home. So I grew up in South Africa during a time of immense political and social change, as you can imagine. Nobody will do what you say just because you're telling them. You actually have to empower them, you have to coach them, you need to mentor people so that they understand what's in it for them and they grow on the in inside. Really the rock bottom for me came with relationship breakdowns. I felt so unhappy within myself. I knew that there was more that I could do with my life. I knew that I deserved to be more happy, but I wasn't happier. So I believed that success was working hard and I was prepared to put my back into it. And I, I thought that the harder I worked, the more successful I would be. Being quite honest with ourselves when we wake up in the morning and when we go to bed at night is how was my day and how is my life actually really doing is probably one of the bravest things that we can do. Success for me is being my best self, cherishing each moment and having a clear understanding of my strengths and the direction that I want to move in, both in my work and life. We can't really control the future and we can't control how other people perceive us. We can only control ourselves. So if being present helps you to do that, it can only enhance your journey. I'm on a mission to help the world to see success differently. We're sharing the stories of our guests. I hope to inspire those that listen. This is the Different Hats podcast produced by H2 Productions. I hope you can join us on this journey. Okay, I'm just going to say something about one of our sponsors, Rivervale. The world of cars, vans and minibuses is often a pain point for many of us. The hassle of finding the right vehicle, let alone looking after it, are all more things to add to our lists as busy people. Rivervale's mission is to make motoring manageable, and that's why they provide leasing, purchasing, servicing and vehicle management. So whether you have one family car or a fleet of vans for your business, Rivervale are your trusted vehicle supplier. Visit www rivervale.co.uk okay let's jump back to the podcast okay welcome to another episode of the podcast my guest this week is the founder and ceo of crest coaching and hr she's a coach and mentor keynote speaker and leadership consultant she's a best-selling author and a recent published solo book your voyage to success how to ride the crest of a wave and reach your full potential in life and work has become a number one bestseller on amazon I'm delighted to welcome Desiree Anderson to the podcast. How are you? Oh, very well. Lovely to meet you, Sam. And you, and you. I've been, it's been great because obviously we covered the book launch when um, in SBT um, a few months back, obviously. And um, as soon I, I remember reaching out to you not long after because I was like, oh, this is the essence almost of the podcast, talking about <laughs> success and our voyage and how, how you described it, which was, was amazing. So I'm really keen. I've got obviously the book here that I've been reading, which is fantastic. So it's been, um, yeah, I'm really excited to delve into it a little bit. And, I'm and so delighted. Like amazing. Well, look, well, as always, we sort of kick off the podcast. I want to paint a little bit of a picture about yourself and... Um, I always believe that people's life, their story starts somewhere, right? And we want to go back to the beginning almost and just delve a little bit into, talk to me about something about life growing up and now that's sort of shaped who, who sits in front of me today. Yes, yeah, so I grew up in South Africa during a time of immense political and social change, as you can imagine. Mm. So that was the backdrop. But my parents themselves got divorced when I was five. And after that, my mum moved around as a, as a single mum, qu battling quite a bit money-wise. Mm. And I was put in about eight schools before the age of 12. Mm. However, I always excelled academically, luckily, but I did find it quite a lonely place to be. And I think delving back years later, when I began my coaching journey, I realized how much that had shaped my thoughts about success and about the world around me, seeing it more as a fearful type of a place rather than a place where I could feel full trust in myself to achieve what, what I wanted to. So I've had to really go on a long journey myself mm. 
a real voyage to through very stormy seas to get to this place. Years later, when I was in my first few years of work as an HR consultant, after having studied at the University of Cape Town, I emigrated, which in itself was a massive change. Mm. And true to form, I brought all my things with me, unpacked them, and have been here to stay ever since. So this is my home. Amazing, amazing. Um, talk, talk to me a bit about that then, about at school, that you said, uh, going around to the different schools, and how does, how does that impact? I guess at a, a young age as well but I suppose if you thrived academically did you was you okay in that situation or yes I think from an academic perspective it was okay I managed to pick up even where I was taken out of the school say halfway mm. through the year but we moved towns as well so it meant leaving everything that I knew mm. and starting again so there was no roots or foundation in my life technically mm. I found that quite difficult because I found that when I went into the school ground, it was almost as if I needed to be a bit of a people pleaser. I realize that now to make friends because otherwise I felt that I'd be an outcast. I wasn't naturally part of the group then. So I did find myself almost dimming my own light. I didn't want to be that sort of top of the class person. And even if I was, I would sort of shrink back a little bit and almost be a little bit too self defeating so mm. that I could fit in. So I started those kind of behaviours when I was at quite a young age to survive, I guess. Yeah, that's really interesting. I spoke recently on here actually with a, um, a guy called uh, uh, Dr. Graham Curtis who works up at Roffey Park and he talked about this, about how we almost as a, as a race, we, we try and collude, we try and fit in to in our environments, don't we? We want to be, feel part of a community, feel part of something, don't we? And we want to connect with people, which is going to those different schools. Like you say, you sort of almost, what's interesting to listen to there is how you wouldn't try, excel in that, try and push yourself in that way because you wanted to collude, you wanted to fit in to that to that environment, which is it's fascinating, isn't it? When you, When you sort of unpick that and look at it. It is fascinating and quite sad to think mm. how many people I've discovered do that. Mm. And it becomes a learned behavior. Mm. As you bring yourself into adulthood, you take all those things with you. And it takes many, many years to then find your true success, your true uniqueness, mm. and really shine in your own light. And I do notice many adults struggling with that possibly yeah. because of learned behaviours in their past. Mm. And it is so sad because we all have so much to give. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. And I think, well, t talk to me then about, like, with that, I guess, uh, did, did you, I guess from your, your uh, being at school and, and excelling academically, going on to university, what, what was your, you obviously went into HR and stuff, what was your, I guess, did you have dreams and ambitions when you were younger? What was your... Where, 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 what was your thing I wanted to do? What, was it always that route? Yes, like most of us, it, it sort of changed through the years. Yeah. I first wanted to become a psychologist, which I suppose isn't that different to what sure. I'm currently doing sure. in the sense that you have to really listen to others and it mm. becomes their actionable, their accountability to mm. move their lives forward. But as I moved through the school system, I was really propelled by my mother's story and wanting to insulate myself against any hardship that may come my way in the future financially. And I saw it in those years as getting a good education. That was my take on it. And I remember standing at the University of Cape Town when I got my first degree and I could see the the mountain behind me and I had my sash on billowing in the wind you know I, I picture that scene often mm. and I remember thinking okay I'm fine now I've actually I'm all right I'm going mm. to be insulated against life hard, life's hardships which of course as we know that doesn't happen yeah. no matter how much education you've got that's only one tiny piece of the puzzle and doesn't even have to be yeah. because it's how you implement all your life's experience so then I uh, had graduated in with business psychology nice. and social work um, so it was a social science degree and then I went on to do a honours degree in human resources 
and subsequently done a lot more study over in the UK as I had to re-qualify myself, which was another journey in itself. But back then, it was really wanting to help people, wanting to, I knew that I had an, an, an empathetic connection with others mm. due to probably my own hardships that I'd faced. And I had that ability to help people and draw others in and make them feel valued. Mm. And even then I knew that there would be something for me to do where I could shine my light, but I didn't quite understand our own, my own unique power and all of our unique power. I think then I sort of went into a job where you tell people what to do. And it was only years later when I realized nobody will do what you say just because you're telling them. Mm. You actually have to empower them. You have to coach them. You need to mentor people so that they understand what's in it for them and they grow mm. on the in inside. And years later when I published in some collaborations talking about my own life, my own childhood, my own early career, I then realized that I had actually not dealt with the inner Desiree at all. It was all external. Let's get the next degree. Let's get the next good job. And, and so I went on to autopilot in South Africa. And then again, when I landed in the UK, working for quite leading companies worldwide in HR, yeah. I had a great career, but inside I was really still quite I would say, raw about everything that had happened. Amazing. And what, I mean, do you, do you look back, because obviously with your parents spitting up and, and stuff and uh, I guess frying yourself into education and academically, but do, 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 do you look at your uh, as a fond childhood like growing up and uh, in South Africa? What was great about Africa, and we touched on this a little earlier prior mm. to the podcast, was... It was lovely growing up in the sun, as you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck it down with rain today. <laughs> yeah. um, moving on, I, moving on. <laughs> I think it was also a land of contrasts. And certainly growing up, I saw a lot of things that I wouldn't necessarily have thought that anything was wrong at that point. But of mm. course, in my first year of HR, Nelson Mandela was released. And that was quite interesting because I suddenly, as quite a young HR person, was thrust into a situation where I needed to run diversity programs within my company. And if I think about it now, what did I know really about diversity mm -hmm. growing up? And I then had to get people into a room and to talk about their experiences mm -hmm. and help them to express their culture, show other people what their traditions were. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. But there were some tough times there, really getting to grips with empathy for everybody and their journey and how they come into leadership, into organizations, into entrepreneurship. Mm. They've all got a different story to tell, and we never really know what's going on mm -hmm. inside somebody. So I found that fascinating in South Africa, and I was able to take that cutting-edge experience mm -hmm. and and have that knowledge already when I came over to the UK. So I would say Africa was a fantastic starting point for me in my career. Yeah, amazing. And then, I, mean, talk to, I, I often, I know we sort of spoke previously as well off air about, I'm, I'm always keen on here to talk about people's challenges that they faced and how they've overcome them and to share, because you know, we, we live in a world where, especially with social media, people put their highlight reels on and we see you know, things that are a perfect life uh, that w people are leading on social media and yet actually, as we mentioned about authenticity and being honest and sharing some of those challenges. And I know you mentioned in the book as well about obviously a couple of points hit, hitting rock bottom um, for yourself, like I'd, be, I'd be keen to delve into what, what was what was rock bottom for you, and what, how did you talk to us about that experience and how you overcome that? Yeah, so starting from my journey when I arrived in the UK, I immediately got jobs, and I found that my people pleasing had really hit an all time high because I was very conscientious at work and I would just say yes to any job that somebody ca gave me. Mm. I'd work very long hours and I slowly become extre came, became extremely burnt out, but also dissatisfied sometimes with what I saw in some of the organizations I worked for and some of the suffering that 
some of the leaders came to tell me about and how they were struggling to just be productive no matter what. Mm. It wasn't enough emphasis on mental health, uh, enough empathy for work-life balance. And I found I didn't have enough empathy for myself. But really the rock bottom for me came with relationship breakdown. So of course, by then I'd been over here for about a decade and uh, I was still away from all of my family that live over there. Mm. Um, and I decided to, to leave because I think at that stage I'd started to become more aware of myself, my own accountability, but also how people should be treated, both in organizations and personally. So I'd really grown as a person and I guess grown out of that relationship. Mm. And But it became quite bitter and it meant that I had to move, well, I moved out of my house to be out of the situation. Mm. It then ended up a huge battle during which I had to go and stay at the YMCA. So you can imagine having wow. been all, all of my life in very good, well-earning positions, suddenly mm. fighting tooth and nail for my home mm. after the emigration, which had been everything really. I'd put everything into it. And then finding myself at the YMCA was an incredibly humbling experience because I remember one day going down the road and seeing a homeless person and thinking to myself, you know, now I understand how something can just snap happen in your life and you can end up mm. rock bottom. And it was really at that rock bottom stage in my life where I had to really think about what had actually happened, my, as I say, my accountability, my contribution to the breakdown. And I say that with respect to anybody who's been in relationships because mm. I think – Sometimes there is m maltreatment. However, you all always need to look at yourself. But I think it was then that I realized all the patterns of self-sabotage that I had created in my own life, mirroring how I'd been brought up. That kind of rock bottom scenario where we had to move towns, you know, start again, make friends again. I had then gone rock bottom in my own life. Um, at that stage, I was doing contracting, so consulting, contracting. And so I sort of just stopped contracting for a while and uh, got the divorce over and done with. Came out not so great, but I felt that I had my mental health, I had my life, and I'd made a choice to put myself first. And it wasn't long after that that I had the breakthrough to become a coach. And I'll tell you more about that later. Yeah, amazing. And then I guess... Just from a mindset point of view, so maybe some people listening, whether they're going for a breakup or you know struggling in business or whatever it is, what 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 do you think it was about your mindset at that point that got you out of that and made like because like like you just alluded to there, we we have I guess we have a choice at, at whatever point we're at in our life and you know you can choose to go one way or you can choose this way. What was it about you? Do you think? Like, your mindset at that point that made you make that choice I'm going to I'm going to keep going I'm going to go this way I think it was really understanding more about what I wanted for my life going forward mm. and starting to take small actions to put myself first and when I realized that there was resistance in my own environment to, to do that there was a conflict and I, I felt that I was getting more and more burnt out just trying to people please, both in my home life and work. And I think it was that sh shift of realizing something's wrong here. I'm, I'm not quite feeling that level of success that I want to feel in my life. Mm. And of course, that's a very unique thing. But I felt so unhappy within myself. I knew that there was more that I could do with my life. I knew that I deserved to be more happy but I wasn't happier. Um, so I think it was at th that gap I started to become more aware of. Now that could have been due to experience. It could have been due to having gone through so many ups and downs. I think eventually you get to the point where you say, hang on, I'm either going to drift further down here or I'm going to get myself back up. Perhaps as a child, I developed the resilience which I'm very grateful for, of being able to take myself from rock bottom and move forward. So that bravery, that resilience, and knowing maybe there was a glimmer of knowing I could get myself out of it. Mm. 
Mm. So that small belief, although it was very, very slight at that point in myself saying, hang on, I can see that crack of light. I, I'm going to move towards it. Yeah. So I guess I just for, for all of us, it's just that hope is a huge thing, right? Just having that little bit of hope, whatever that looks like, having a little bit of hope. If we've got that, we've, we can make choices, can't we? We can still believe. And that little bit of hope, that, that belief that things are going to be okay and you're going to take steps. I guess a key thing is what, at that point, and what sort of steps did you you take to cl- start to climb on that ladder to to success or to, to getting yourself in that place? Because like, like I say, just for people listening, I guess like practical steps that they can go, right, okay, really, this is where I am at the moment and I know I've got more to give and I want to get out there. How, what steps did you take at that point? Yeah, I made a little plan. I could not see too far ahead of me at that point. And I think sometimes that is difficult for people when you're so far down a hole, you've, you've been so battered by the waves of life, you can't really lift yourself up and think, oh, five years' time, I'm going to be the CEO of Chris <laughs> Coaching and <laughs> yeah. HR or whatever. Yeah. You know, I think the, the practical steps I would say is I believed that there was a better life for me. Mm. I believed that I needed to get myself the basics, such as shelter, got myself a, a, a rented flat. So I had to move from, you know, owning my own place to, to renting at that point. Got myself a new job, had to put my glad rags on and go for the interview. And yeah. and also I was quite honest in the interview. Look, this is what I've just been through. And the chap loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was hired the next day. I think it was right. then and there that I realized, be honest about your story, but always be positive about what you can give mm-hmm. in the situation to others, both in terms of your empathy to help somebody else that's down, but also in the workplace or in your social circle or for your hobby. Um, So practical steps, but also that self-belief. And then I started to be very choosy about who I surrounded myself with. One or two people that I could really trust that it showed through their actions during my dark time Mm. that they were there for me. And I think it's those small steps that you need to take to make yourself a small plan um, rather than a huge strategic, mm. you know, I will conquer the world mm. because you don't feel like that at that point. And once I'd reached those small steps on the, I don't know if you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but mm. it was right on that bottom. I had to get those things right. Mm. And just that belief that nobody was going to mess with me to that extent ever again, I made myself that pact. Mm. And then it was trying to ask for help, getting help from the others who could see that I had more as well. So that belief in me too, I think that's quite important that you have those close people to yeah. you that, that do believe in you no matter what. Yeah. There's a couple of things there really interesting for me. Like what, one, I think that asking for help is such a key message, especially if we talk about mental health. Um, because again, and I talk, I guess, especially from a, a man's point of view, sometimes that, Asking for help is a, a difficult thing to, to do. Um, again, vulnerability, the narrative out there about being weakness, which it's not. I've, I've, I've learned from my own experience, I think, and conversations on here, a lot, we talk about mental health a lot about how much of a strength it is to, to, to be vulnerable and, and do that. And it's interesting to see. I think I'm really interested as well to talk, delve in a little bit about the, the, the people pleasing side of things that you, because I think. I've referred to myself quite a lot. Like that. I often say yes to a lot, and and as we talked prior to coming on about getting better at sort of saying saying no, and learning. So I'm keen to just do you, do you think like like you said with the people pleasing that that was from f- from your childhood and like you say going to the different schools and that's where that sort of come trying to fit in that that, that people pleasing that where that come from. I definitely think it came from childhood, but I also think it came from my belief of what success was Mm. at that point. So I believed that success was working hard and I was prepared to put my back into it. And I I thought that the harder I worked, the more successful I would be. Mm. And that if I said no, other people would somehow try to sabotage that success and not work with me in terms of that success. So to keep the peace and to keep navigating forward, I now realize that 
I became a real people pleaser where I never thought of myself first. It was always about what can I do for others? How can I help them lift themselves? Or how can I make sure that I just get through the day and work till, you know, 10 o'clock if, if necessary and get my job done so that somebody would say, Deirdre, you've done a really good job. You, you, you're good mm-hmm. at what you do. So it was a combination of my past my belief that success was partly fueled by others' acceptance of me and that success was just hard work, which I now know is absolute rubbish. Mm. There's so much more to it than that. Yeah, that's because there there is this something, there's an element, especially, I guess, within entrepreneurship um, and business owner about that, you know, you've got the whole hustle culture that we could delve into, you know, actually the harder I work, the more successful I'm going to be and you know people posting I'm here I am at one o'clock in the morning still working away and you know and it's almost like we wear this hard work this busyness as a badge of honour isn't it and like actually when you really look at that that's not that's not success is it (laughs) it's totally not I mean I I remember one incident I was at the train station in London at 10 o'clock at night I'd been in a consulting role for a corporate. This was years mm. after my relationship split, so I was still working on the people-pleasing aspect. Mm. And I knew that I had to get back to, to Surrey, and then I had to commute back and get back to work by 8 o'clock the next morning. And I just stood there waiting for the train. Everything was dark. I'd seen the cleaners come into the corporate office, and I thought to myself, goodness me, Desiree, what are you doing? Mm to stay at work so late. And I realized then and then that my, I'd been kidding myself that my vision of success and what I really wanted were two different things. Just before we move on to the success, and I'm really keen to tap into your definition. One other thing I want to take from what what you just talked about as well, especially in that interview and the honesty and authenticity, I guess, of people sharing their stories in a more honest and authentic way. Again, back to the vulnerability piece. We mentioned again, just prior to being off air, I remember being during lockdown, prior to that, being the person who was like, yeah, I'm an optimist and I'm I'm positive all the time and I've got to be positive all the time. And you go out and, yeah, of course, business is really good. And, da, 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 da. and then actually, I couldn't do that during lockdown because business was crap because <laughs> everything shut down. So you have to be more honest and I certainly am on more on that path now, but I, I think what I struggled with, I'd be keen to get your take on this, what I struggled with was, because I'm an optimist and I've got a smile on my face, and that's the that's how I portray myself, and that's the type of person I am, and I, I am generally an optimist, but I felt that if I was, you know, being down, but saying stuff, that, oh, this is not great, or this is a struggle, my, my impression was that, oh, well, people see me as a negative person, and I didn't. I, I struggled with that, that side of it. So I, I was always, oh no, I've got to be like this. But actually, I guess what I've started to realise is that it's okay to. It doesn't make me a negative person by going. Actually, I'm having a quite a tough time at the moment. Um, this is happening in business or whatever. And just again sharing that honesty. I think I'd be keen to just there were your thoughts around that sort of. Why, why, why do we crave that? I guess, or why do we do that? Yeah, I'd love to hear that part of your story because I think we do place pressure on ourselves sometimes by being too positive mm. because we think that just like working hard, we need to be so positive because that means we've got this resilience, we're pushing forward no matter what. And then on the other hand, there's the vulnerability that many people are saying, you know, open your heart, say exactly what's what's inside. And, and in so doing, you're more honest with yourself. I think it's a little bit of a balance there. In my in my personal experience and, and the experience I've had coaching others, I think it is all about starting to be honest with yourself about how you really are feeling. And remember that other people can learn from our story. So when we are being authentic, we should be doing that from a perspective of trying to help others. Mm. Maybe you've had a really down day, but you're coming to talk to somebody who's also really perhaps they've just lost a parent or something really tragic has happened in their life. Mm -hmm. And if you open up and just say, well, I've had a really bad time, perhaps you're not connecting with that person in that moment. So to me, it is about 
owning our own story, owning our own emotions, but also being responsible towards others and establishing a healthy connection with others. Because not everybody has gone as deeply as we may have. Everybody's at a different stage of their journey. And so sometimes I've seen people crack open that shell of themselves and then they helping others to to do the same. However, others are still extremely uncomfortable with that. Mm. So I th- my tip would be meet other people where you perceive they are in their journey, establish a connection. And in so doing, if you feel that empathy by showing your vulnerability will help them, mm. it is something that you could start slowly adding into the relationship. And I do believe that being being quite honest with ourselves when we wake up in the morning and when we go to bed at night is how was my day and how is my life actually really mm. doing is probably one of the bravest things that we can do. And if we do say to somebody, business is crap at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with it. I think what's always important there is do mention one or two positive things that you've been doing. Mm. You know, so at the moment I'm having a lot of doing a lot of affirmations I'm watching YouTube videos I'm I'm learning from my mentor perhaps how I can tweak my journey you know what could you teach me about that is there any tip that you have so it's always it's authenticity but it's connection it's responsibility within that connection I love that I love that I think definitely I guess for, for me that's one of the reasons that I guess I love doing this so much because uh, you're able to have these type of conversations and you're able to connect because I, I, I'm always very honest on here and I talk about my you know struggles with mental health or difficult times that I have had um, and I've been fortunate that people sh- share theirs as well and like you say you can f- through that vulnerability and through sharing authentically your story you do build real connections with people. And I so, like for me, the power, you know, everything I do really in regards to the podcast, the magazine, the events we host are all surrounded around storytelling and how we can really build that true connection. And I, and I, I, I completely agree with what, you, what you're saying there in, in relation to that. I want to move on then and just talk then about, and like I said, we've, we've restructured this episode slightly differently because I want to I want to go into, delve into the book a, a, a lot more. Um I just want to, because I usually finish off with this, but this will lead us nicely into the book, I guess. Um, but just tell me, what, what, what's, how, do you, how do you define success now then? What's your definition of success? Success for me is being my best self, cherishing each moment and having a clear understanding of my strengths and the mm. direction that I want to move in, both in my work and life. And then, so let's, I mean, because uh, the, the book is called, obviously, Your Voyage to Success, so, and I really want to, I want to look, at it's obviously in, in, in two parts, um, and, and I, I want to just almost go through each different chapter, if we can, and sort of just unpick some of, of those, some of those parts, so sort of starting off um, with... Just tell the listeners a little bit about that uh, opening chapter is about clarity. And I guess listen to your story there and the start of your journey on, on to your voyage of success, that, that clarity is a key part of the, of the starting point, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I definitely believe that clarity is the starting point. So just going back a little, the voyage to success is in the two parts. So the first part is finding your quest yeah. in the waves of life. And then riding your wave. Mm. So finding your quest, C being clarity, is really about the honesty you and I have talked about, Mm. Sam. And that that is a journey I'm still on. Being honest with myself as to where I'm at right now, but being kind as well. And we'll go into that in a minute. Mm. But the clarity of how is my life now? Really? How, how, How am I feeling about it? What is that honesty that I can give myself when no one else is around, when I don't have to people please or be a perfectionist? What, do I, what am I really feeling? And what is the disconnect there between where I want to go and where I am now? And then starting to formulate some goals, some visions for what I want in my future. So that's where the first chapter starts. And it's quite an insightful 
journey that I've had along the way in terms of that. And I share that mm. in the first chapters. But I think unless you're honest with yourself, what you'll do is you'll just add some more layers of achievement onto this journey, mm. which then causes you stress in another way. Mm. So if I was to ask you now then about clarity, where, where are you right now in your life? Talk to me about that. What's your... So I think that clarity is something that it is a continuous journey. Mm. I feel much clearer about myself, who I am, I've embraced my dark spots. I've in embraced my blind spots. And I'm actually able to say where I've gone wrong. And sometimes that takes a lot of guts, mm. right? Because we want to be right. We want to know that we're a good person. Or I certainly feel like there's an element in me that wants to be that good person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I just have to accept, you know, where I messed up. So I think that honesty has really come home to me. I do still work on my own self-belief, especially when I deal with challenges, both in business and in life. Perhaps somebody hasn't treated me right, or I come across people who I can see are still on a journey for their own discovery of their success. And they can sometimes butt heads with you in that sense, because they don't want to move forward. But what I've learned as a coach is you take each person on their own merits and you have an unconditional acceptance for each person. And I believe that I've, I've started to achieve that. And it's a great enlightening moment when you can say that. And, and can you even, well, you mentioned there about if people maybe have wronged you or are you able to still look at that from with empathy you still have to look at that person like if someone has or how, what are you like in regards to with toxic people there's some people I've spoke to on here who've just gone remove toxic people I know there was one guy I spoke to a friend of mine come on um, runs a marketing agency and he was like he, I have a cull every year and I'll get if people have been toxic in my life I will just remove them what was your view around that man toxic removing toxic people yes I do think that Toxic people, it depends on our definition of toxic. Yeah. Sometimes toxic is just because we haven't reached our own level of development to understand other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. So that's where clarity comes in because we need to check what part of their toxicity is irritating me. What can I learn from that? And what is toxic within me? And that's a hard-reaching question. Mm -hmm. that, that is the reason why I'm feeling jarred by that because sometimes people's... Toxicity is actually telling us something about ourselves. It's a mirror. And I'd leave you with that. That is quite a, a deep subject, but it is one that I go into with, with many of my clients because I always believe everything teaches us something about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But, of course, I don't believe that we should keep people close to us that are harming us in any way. But I do believe that we need to first come to the party ourselves and grow because you'll find that you become a lot more tolerant where the people are mm. are against you or they maybe disagree with you. You can look at that. Take the learning, but not take everything that they do on board and don't don't be so influenced by that in terms of your own self image and thinking you're not good enough. You're always good enough no matter what somebody else thinks of you. Mm. I guess that that clarity element and being in that position take takes a lot of a lot of self-awareness doesn't it to, to get to that point to be able to like you say to look at someone else's behaviors analyze them but actually rather than just cutting that person off recognizing actually what is it about that relationship that's broken down with us and being self-aware enough to look inside and look at yourself I guess is what I'm taking from that Absolutely. And I do believe self-awareness is something that we're continuously looking at as human beings, as we evolve, as different situations present themselves in our lives. So it's never something that we can say, yeah, I'm self-aware, that's great. <laughs> but what it is about is having a really true f image of yourself, what you stand for, your strengths, and why you're in this world 
your uniqueness and what c- you can give to others. And then that unwavering self-belief helps you when you encounter both tough times, which we all get, no matter how self-aware we are, yeah, yeah. we will always face difficulties. And also we will face people that aren't always our tribe. But if you know who is your tribe, what values, what beliefs those people would have that, that are that core of people, and you've got those people around you, together with your own self-belief. I think you can take each situation or person on their own merits and decide for yourself. Mm. Firstly, what are they teaching you? But secondly, do I want that person in my life? And it doesn't mean just because I don't want them in my life, it's a, oh, they're terrible. It just means they're not really part of your tribe. Not everybody is going to be our greatest cheerleader. Mm. And that's fine too. Yeah. I do. I think, for me, I find this really fascinating with the talk, I, I I read a lot about that sort of subject, and looking at, and I know that I've, I've spoke openly on here about me, me and my wife have known each other since we was eleven. We've been together twenty eight years now, um, and actually went through a really tough time a couple of years ago. Um, she was perimenopausal, and actually we went through a stage at that point where, prior to recognising that she um, she was perimenopausal, that actually I was like. This is just a toxic relation. We're just not getting on. We're not. But it was only the ability to, I guess, because of our history. I remember looking at. I, I love this woman. She's mother of my children, and I love her. And she's an amazing, amazing individual. But we were just like this, and it was only then that we, you know, when she was diagnosed with having perimenopause, we talked about it and we got through that. And it was actually me looking at the stuff I was doing to cause them, rather than me just going, oh no, it's all her, and she's a toxic person. I, I can, can't believe that my wife of 28 years is a toxic person. I couldn't get my head into that space. Um, but things weren't right. But then when you sort of then uh, looked at myself a little bit more, I guess, going, what can I do to help this situation? So I read books about menopause and how, and then all of a sudden we're on a different path and we're in a, better place now and we've got through them things but I think it's so important as you're what I find really interesting what you said is about how actually looking at a situation looking at a person but first and foremost then looking at looking at ourselves to make those potential changes that we can do it's not always on that other person right I love what you said there and and that was a tough time Mm. to go through and a great example of how we don't know what somebody else is going through. But at the same time, it's so important in a situation like that to take care of ourselves, perhaps get outside help, educate ourselves, but also know where our boundaries are. Because I think we can have so much empathy for others that we can weaken our boundaries to and start accepting behavior and situations that perhaps aren't right. I. I recently had a situation where a friend of mine passed away and her husband has had a really tough time looking after her and nobody was really looking at him and him himself at his needs Mm. and and how his mental health was suffering. So, of course, he was caring for her and helping her Mm. in that time. But in so doing, he felt resentful. His mental health was suffering. So that's an extreme example. Mm. But there of where he had to look after himself too. So I think this is where we have to have the empathy but also pull back to that belief in ourselves and know what's right but not take everything personally Mm. because not everything everybody does is about us. It's actually about them and what they're going through. Yeah. I guess that's where the whole... Like the ego side of things come in, doesn't it? If we think it's always going to be about us or whatever, the, the, it's letting go of that ego, isn't it? A little bit in ourselves to go, it's not always about us. It's like you said, what are they going through? Where? And that's where the empathy, I guess, comes in. Because you're able to, if you're able to take the ego away, take a step back and look at and put yourself in someone else's, that's why empathy is, isn't it? Putting, someone, putting yourself in someone else's position, what are they going through? What is what are they struggling with and then you can view it from a different perspective through a different lens I guess yeah I guess if we're looking at anything from a different perspective it softens our view Mm. and one of the hardest part of clarity is actually putting our own need to be right aside Mm. it's something I still have to work on of course we've all got an ego and that identity has developed 
through the years, through different reinforcements that we've had. And we also feel entitled to certain things in our relationships. And that's hard to put that aside. And I guess it's knowing what's negotiable and what's non-negotiable in our lives Mm. too. Mm. Where to draw the line and where to say, hang on a moment, you also need to take accountability for your actions, you know. I, I can empathize with you, but there's only so much I can actually go through myself. Mm, yeah. I, I want to touch, because we, we obviously ho- highlighted there a little bit about about empathy, and there's obviously a, a couple of, the next couple of chapters, it talks about release and empathy as well. In, in the, uh, those things. There was a couple of, I, fa- I found these two chapters actually, I sort of mentioned it prior, like, I found it quite difficult to read that, personally just because it was a lot of the questions you ask in there of yourself was very much holding a mirror up to myself I think um like I've, I've, I've highlighted a couple here like do you feel disappointed in yourself do you constantly feel guilty that you haven't done enough um from a release point of view and then empathy as well I'm nicer to other people than I am myself and I often put other people's needs before my own to those those specific four ones there, I guess I looked at. I was like, I do do them things. I'm aware of that. I think there's something about where we prioritise ourselves and something I'm really struggling, I've struggled with in the past, I guess, and where I am on that journey to it is that we should always put ourselves first. Above, uh, if someone asked me where I'd be, I'd be my kids, my wife, mum and dad family and I'm be somewhere down there um, and then th- there's that great analogy about the put your own face mask on first when you're on an airplane and, and that should be in life shouldn't it yeah that's so interesting what you say because everything that I put in the book is a mirror to myself and my own growth as mm. well so that's the first thing I want you to know is yeah. that I'm also on that journey And I do think that, especially with my upbringing, it was so hard to put myself first. Mm. It took me decades to realize that I was actually worthy worthy enough, but also that it didn't make me a bad person Mm. to put myself first because I thought being a good person was looking after everybody else first, making sure they're all right. So your partner, your kids, making sure they're fine and your parents, and I have parents that, that need help, so... I've always been the one in the family to look after everybody else Mm -hmm. until I realized that until I developed a good self-esteem, I was actually maybe in a small way without realizing it, and this may not be true for everybody, but holding a small resentment that sometimes I had to sacrifice so much for everybody else Mm -hmm. and perhaps part of me was left behind. So I guess if you if you put other people on a pedestal, make sure you also are on a pedestal. Mm. Make sure that you've done that that hard work and that all your needs are being fulfilled and that you can ask others to help you fulfill those needs. Because sometimes we can't just fulfill our own needs. We have to ask others as well for their help, their encouragement along the way, their give and take, their reinforcements, helping around the house, for instance, or playing their part in their roles as, as kids or, or parents not expecting too much from from their their children and leaving generational legacies of doubt and fear Mm -hmm. etc which has certainly been in some of my journey some of the things I've had to confront which have led to my patterns of putting other people first and I I guess the hard question to ask oneself is how does that make me feel when I put other people first Mm -hmm. does it take away from me or does it add to me how does not putting myself first affect those others that are in my close circle? And is there more that I could give others if I gave more to myself? This is Geo. Geo runs a scarf company. Geo doesn't see the need for telecoms. Everybody uses mobiles now. But can a mobile really be a business phone? Geo is having coffee with a client, Gabby. Well, actually, Geo prefers acacia leaf tea. But what happens when someone calls? It could be a big new deal. Surely it would be rude to take the call? But many people hate leaving messages. They may just call a competitor instead. What can Geo do? The answer is simple. Turn the mobile into a business phone. With the GoGiraffe app, Geo can quickly transfer the call 
or before the meeting, Geo can simply use the app to divert calls. No more missed calls, lost deals or unhappy customers. Turn your mobile into a business phone today. Go Giraffe. Again, I look at that and I think that there's, because I, I don't know necessarily where it comes from, where, but for me, I look at, I like helping other people. I love the thought of, you know, getting to a weekend and I, and my, both had really tough week, me and my wife, but I'll go, I'll book you a massage, I want you to, and that makes me happy that she's going to go out and feel relaxed and come back and feel, that makes, but then... I'm not doing that for myself. I'm not taking myself out of that. And I don't know, how, how do we get that balance right? Because I guess that's the key, isn't it? The same with everything that we talk about, I'm sure. But that balance, getting that balance right. I think the first thing is that's absolutely brilliant and lovely to hear such kindness and such empathy towards your partner. And you need to celebrate that about yourself because that is part of your value system, mm. to be kind and nurturing and and be self-aware, but also be aware of your partner's journey. Mm. And it's a lovely quality. So really embrace that and realize that that is part of your core. That's part of your heart. Mm. At the same time, going back to what I said earlier, what about yourself? So it may not be that you need a massage at the end of the week, but are you taking yourself a way to have some quiet time? Are you having some doing some exercise? Are you reading, taking half an hour to read a book? What is your definition of how you need to de-stress at the end of the week? It may be completely different mm. from your partners or bringing it broader from, from anybody in our lives. Mm. So just be aware of your own uniqueness and always make sure, just like we need to eat the right nutrition, that we're feeding ourselves the right things mentally, mm -hmm. that we always realize we deserve to go for that massage, but we may choose that we don't need it and that our partner needs it more. That's absolutely fine. But it shouldn't be like a seesaw that the one person's getting nurtured and the other one's feeling burnt out. Mm -hmm. That's where I think yeah, it starts no. to become a disconnect. I get that, and I guess start. So I do. I, I swim in the sea most. I love swimming. That's my happy place. I guess, and I try and take myself out, at whatever that looks like. But I, I guess, like, so for me, a lot of the things I will do, I will go. I get. Up, I'm an early riser. So I get up early, and I try and get out and do them things beforehand, so that I don't. I don't want to impact the day for the kids or my wife and stuff. Like that. So even that side of it, I guess, I still look at in others first to, as opposed to and I'm just trying I, I don't know where that I guess I'm trying to unpick where those things come from I'm, and you, you sort of mentioned oh, I'm keen to tap into your journey around this around this specific subject because you mentioned like, obviously it's a mirror like the book is you sharing your story and the mirror that you hold up to yourself as well so I'm keen to tap into your experience with this uh, around that time yeah, so just going back to your point about, for instance, you reorganize your day mm. so that you can take time out for yourself and then you've got more time for your family to do the family activities. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, a, it's about looking at our priorities and then taking the time when we feel it's most needed. But if you had a particularly hard week and you were finding that you were really struggling you may decide to look at that schedule mm. and maybe you might not be able to be with them the whole week and you may have to take yourself time for yourself or, or discuss more about your problems with your wife at that point. But going back to the mirror in the book of myself, I think as you mentioned earlier about the people pleasing and I, I had mentioned it myself about my own journey, mm. so I was a people pleaser. And it's still something, because I've got a big heart as well, that mm -hmm. I would naturally nurture somebody else. I'd naturally reach out to them, which I did when I was in corporates, to try and make sure that everybody was okay. But I think the greatest tool that you can teach somebody is to empower themselves, to start developing that mechanism within themselves that knows where the boundary stops, mm -hmm. checking in with themselves as to how they're actually feeling. And if they aren't feeling good about themselves and pleasing others is detracting from that, 
knowing that they need to do something a little bit different. And my journey really about people pleasing led me to a real burnout one day at work where I was really good at what I did and I was contracting in this particular job and the leader gave me three contractors jobs instead of one. And I just took them on. And I found myself, the phone was ringing, I was running to meetings and I felt really weak the one day and I, I was absolutely, I had to come crashing down because I realized I'd had burnout. So mm. it was nothing to do with my ability to organize my day or my uh, my part, which was great and open towards everybody helping, but it was actually to do with my own self-image of how I constantly had to be the one juggling everything. Um, and I'm mentioning that because juggling a lot of things and having that ability sometimes depletes from yourself. Mm. And only you can be honest with yourself ab about what's truly important to you. And that's why the book goes on a journey. Mm. Sometimes these things are uncomfortable to confront, mm. especially the release of the past, release of our past patterns and what doesn't serve us. And that constant empathy that we need to have for ourselves. I find sometimes... I am my own, own harshest critic, and it's that achievement side of myself that will say, oh, Desiree, you know, why did you do that? But it's actually having compassion with yourself, even when we fail, when I fail. It's actually saying, I did my best at the time. Now let me learn a little bit more and try and do it a bit better next time. Mm. And I get like that. You talk about having compassion, I guess, with yourself. Um, the importance, I guess, delving into the importance of self-talk, uh, how we talk to ourselves. How do you feel? Like, so f f for me, I find it, someone gives me a compliment, I find it really difficult to take that. I feel un really uncomfortable. I will divert from, if someone says, oh, look, you mentioned oh, that's a really kind thing to do, that's a bit, uh, and I, I will just almost dismiss it as if it's not. And I, I, how are you with, with that? And, and I guess does that come back to our own self-belief in, in, in our view of ourselves? Does, is that, does that play a part in that? I agree. I think it does. I think it, it plays the part in that perhaps you feel you don't need that praise you don't want to stand out as you just want to be kind automatically. It, mm. it should should not be something that you want praise for. Mm. However, if you look at it this way, if people give you a compliment, it's really the reflection of you that makes them feel good. And so by acknowledging that compliment, you almost encourage them as well to, to own their own strengths and be able to shine. So if I look at my life, I never really took compliments either. I, I didn't want somebody to tell me I was good and if, if, or I looked good or, you know, I'd done well at school or I was kind or I would put other people first or I'd done something for somebody else which I hadn't really publicized. Mm. I would always say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, and feel very uncomfortable. But I think that was because I hadn't acknowledged that I should be number one in my own life. And I think once you grow into that, but in a kind, nurturing way, that means that it doesn't detract from you. It's because you are earning your own light. You are earning what you were put on this earth to do. Mm. And that is so empowering. And if other people acknowledge it, soak it up and say thank you so much. Because I think it's wonderful if we could all encourage each other more mm. and show each other appreciation for the good things that we did do. Yeah, it's so fast. I, I, I find I find it really because something's happened recently. Like, so, uh, someone I knew that she was like, oh, I'm gonna. She wrote a nomination for me, and I read through it, and I, she, I got really emotional and cried reading. I felt so. She wrote some amazing things, some really really lovely things about me, and I couldn't get my head around it. Like I got really emotional because I just felt really uncomfortable reading all of those nice things about her and I, and I find that difficult to actually tell myself those things. Whereas I come from a place of, you know, you, you can't run a business if you don't believe in yourself. You can't get up every day and go out and do the things you do if you don't have that sort of self-belief. So I find that, find that really real conflict in me. And I thought, I, I, again, I'd be keen to 
see your thoughts on that and your your feelings around that sort of thing. What I guess tools or skills you've developed to get yourself to a better place in relation to that. If we were in a coaching session now, I would get you to go back to the first time you felt uncomfortable when somebody gave you praise or feedback. And we won't go into that now, but it's actually taking yourself back to that time, thinking about where you were, who was with you, what did they say, and why did you feel uncomfortable? And perhaps after this podcast, you can sort of think through that Mm. and then start asking yourself, why was that uncomfortable? And you may have to ask yourself that a few times to get to the real root of what it is mm. that makes you feel uncomfortable, which, as you said, is is a slight shift from self-belief. Self-belief can be here, but it's actually that feeling of other people are saying these good things about me and it's making me feel uncomfortable because they're kind of telling me that I'm a good person, but if they're making it public. Mm. It's that public part of it as well Mm. perhaps you you're great with doing things for people just naturally but but you don't want a fuss made Mm. so what is it about that fuss being made that could be uh, sensitivity for you and why Mm. Uh, i don't have the answers for you because it would have to be something that that is about you sure but does that make sense yeah yeah no it really does and i guess because you mentioned a book about as well about your inner child, I guess, and going back to that place. And I guess that's what you're sort of alluding to. Is to go, and again, I guess one of the reasons are on each episode, we always, I always like to talk about people start their story in their childhood and grow up because so much of that, so much of that impacts who, where we are and who we are today, doesn't it? So true, it does. And Part of my practice, I I do a lot of healing and mindfulness methods such as visualization, meditation, um, something called theta healing, and obviously EFT tapping. Mm. And I do think that when we're going back to our inner child, it's not just a case of go back to our inner child and Mm. heal it. It's, It's actually really being with that inner child and realizing that we have developed strategies to cope with life. And that all these things come from various experiences that we've had that have made us, that have molded us and kept us safe. And so I think forms of mindfulness are also very, very important where we allow ourselves to to really relax rather than forcing ourselves to go deep and and come up with the answer straight away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you will know from swimming or being in nature that the answer just comes just because we allow ourselves to flow. Mm -hmm. And that would be my biggest tip today is don't force any healing, don't force any growth. Just go at your own pace and, and start to put the other pieces of the puzzle, the clarity into place, the release. Because once you're very clear of of who you are, what your life's all about, and where you want it to be different, and you start to release patterns and elements and being aware of those, then you find that that the other things, such as the people-pleasing and the fear of being in the limelight, the fear of getting praise, starts to slowly melt away without you realizing it. And I'm keen to talk about the mindfulness side of stuff because that's something, again, that um, I started meditating a bit last year. I find it quite difficult because we live in a we live in a society, I guess, where, again, we mentioned earlier about being busy and productive and, you know, you've got to be productive all the time. We find it as as individuals, me especially, and I guess a lot of people I've spoke to, especially as entrepreneurs and business owners, actually sitting still and not doing anything and just slowing down is a difficult thing for for people to do, isn't it? Absolutely. I still struggle with that. Yeah. I really have, even this year, at the beginning of this, this year, I said, right, this year I'm even going to embody that more. I'm going to really slow down. If I'm feeling stressed out or I've had a really busy week, I'm going to give myself regular rests throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Even if I don't do anything for half an hour, I'm going to sit down. And that really was a big learning for me to just little things and regular breaks and 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 regular mindfulness. It doesn't have to be a whole long meditation or yeah. a whole long healing session, but it's actually tapping into that subconscious or giving yourself that stillness, like you said, Sam, to to not have to come up with the, the solution, mm. but just to be in that present moment. What could be greater than that? Yeah. 
and that that's that is the key isn't it uh, for so many people I've spoke to on here and I think that for, for everything we're doing in life such a key element is just being present as much as we can at every point in in our day whatever we're doing and I've mentioned on here a few times it, it, for me this is a part where I can feel as present as possible because you're in the conversation and you know, I'm listening to every word and I want to respond to your answers and look at what that looks like so you, you, you're constantly you've got to be present in the moment to, to enable this to happen and I find I guess why I love it so much but again as as business owners and we we come out of that environment and trying to keep trying to remain present is is, is it can be difficult I've always got that emotes I've got to do that and especially worse is when you're with the kids and you're you to be your phone. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a difficult thing to, to to do, but being present is such a such a key thing, isn't it? It's such a key thing, and I think all of us are on that journey to make sure that we appreciate the little things mm. because the little steps, the little parts of our journey, all equate to the the bigger journey in the long run, mm. and we then go start going in the right direction if we're doing the things that nurture our soul. And if we've got a very clear idea of who we are, who we want around us, mm. and the actions that we want to take, I think it's those little things that we do that's going that are going to make all the difference and help us appreciate life. Being present and not trying to control everything is one of the hardest skills to do. And that's where a combination, I think, of coaching mindfulness and just nurturing ourselves in in terms of exercise, swimming, and, and our own unique family situations mm. is so important because we can't really control the future and we can't control how other people perceive us. We can only control ourselves. So if being present helps you to do that, it can only enhance your journey. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to, as, as we move on up, delve a little bit more into the well-being I'll, just before we go on to that I just wanted to cut, touch on the, the the sabotaging success habits that you mentioned I'd, I'd like to delve into that a little bit more why, why is it that we why is it that we do that why do we sabotage our own success habits I guess talk to us a little bit more about that in this second chapter of the book which is release I ask you to draw yourself a graph of all the ups and downs that you've had either in your whole life or a period of time. Mm. And then you can start to see those patterns of where maybe your life has wavered or a particular theme that starts to happen. Mm. Like in my case, it was losing everything and then the ability to build it back up again. And those extreme highs and lows were almost like an adrenaline junkie. You know, I can mm. sort of relate it to bungee jumping or something <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that yeah. because it was so detrimental to my mental health and to my life to have to do that. So I think that we have a number of, of self-sabotage habits such as fear of success, which I've definitely had in my life, fear of failure, which causes one to feel mm. that you have to constantly move forward and achieve, perfectionism, having to get it all right, procrastination, I definitely had that at the beginning of writing the book, yeah. um, from a lifelong of being at boarding school and, and not liking exams, st waking up in the early hours of the morning and quickly crashing my, my studying before I wrote it out of boredom. And I think there's lots of these kind of imposter syndrome habits that we have as well that almost stop us from reaching the true state of success that we want in our lives. And only you know what those habits are in your life. But once you start to become more aware of them, I had them all. Mm. Definitely a fear of failure and definitely a fear of success because I'd never really seen my own parents ride that wave in a comfortable way in their life. It was always sort of the peak and then the fall. And so I think that self-sabotage is part of our subconscious. It starts to keep us safe um, from, uh, we either fight or it's the flight or the freeze. Mm. And it's starting to understand that in our habits and know that we can't really continue like that because it will burn us out. Mm. 
We all have them, and we can have them at different stages as well in our career and our lives. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure if I asked you, you'd, you'd identify with one or, one or two of those mm-hmm. behaviours that I've mentioned. Yeah, there's a few bits, actually, I'd have to delve in. So a couple of bits really with fear of... Talk to me about your relationship with failure now, then. Because like, so, so much in relation to our narrative around what we tell ourselves about failure will stop us, and that fear will stop us from doing stuff. But what, what's your, and where you are in your journey now, what's your, what's your relationship like with failure? Yeah, so I never realised that I was a bit of a perfectionist in the sense that I didn't want to fail because it said to me that I wasn't good enough. Mm. And it played to all those insecure parts of me that were quite rife underneath the surface, mm. that I wanted to feel like I was a su- success not just in my eyes, but in other people's eyes. That's a big one because that goes to the ego part of ourselves that we spoke about earlier. So I think fear of failure, where I am at now is I'm on a journey, I learn, I learn from my mistakes. That's probably one of the key things is where I have failed or where I have made mistakes, of which there have been many, I take stock of them and I take the part of the feedback, either from myself or others, that I can move forward in my journey. I give myself that empathy for not being perfect, but I also try and do better next time in terms of growing as a person. So I don't want to repeat the same mistakes again and again and again, because that's showing me a self-sabotage pattern, and I have to examine that. But it's actually almost realizing that we are perfectly imperfect, and that actually failure is part of my success, And in fact, some of my greatest learnings in life have come from messing up so completely and really starting to have more empathy with myself so that I've got a much bigger heart for other people and understanding when they are failing, how it makes them feel. Mm. Because it's so vulnerable, isn't it, to feel that we, uh, to fear failure. Whereas if we can embrace it, just like fear of the future, if we Mm. can just embrace the present, and do the best we can and realize that we're not, we're not great. And I've learned that in leadership as well. Being vulnerable, of course, is great, but also accepting when somebody gives you feedback mm-hmm. that maybe you aren't perfect. And it, it really does take, you know, you standing on your own two feet. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if somebody says to you, I don't really like that, or the way you came across mm-hmm. didn't really connect with me oh you know that can be tough right but it's actually just realizing that we're all on a journey Mm. i i'm on a journey and i'm just doing the best i can Mm. i love i i I was at uh, an event last night actually um the stephen bartlett the irm ceo it was he he was getting up to and he was talking very similar in in relation to failure he's actually so much so as a leader um in his team he's got someone who's head of failure and how, how can they that they constantly look at what they do making, making mistakes and because I guess from a coach and a leadership point of view I'll be keen, like, again it's what, what do we do as, as leaders as leaders we've got to, no one wants to fail but actually accepting that failure is part of a journey and a learning curve I think that's the that's the key for me isn't it it's the he said yesterday he said failure is feedback feedback is knowledge and knowledge is power and I loved that and I thought that was a really good way of, of changing that narrative around what we believe to failure to be I love that and, and Stephen Bartlett's one of my heroes love, yeah. love, love him and his realism from being in corporates and, and many businesses around the world, I would say that it's the leaders that were able to embrace the lessons and encourage that psychological safety within their teams mm. that stood out for me. However, many environments didn't. And I found that many times when people did fail, they were either pushed out of the organization or shamed into feeling so guilty about it and having to send emails around the organization admitting their mistakes. Um, Mm -hmm. That was then an excuse for them to be lynched by other departments, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I think practical steps for leaders are that within your team, encourage people to share not only their successes in the week when you're having a a Zoom meeting or a face-to-face meeting, but actually failures 
re reframe that failure. It's actually learnings. And how can we then learn, learn from others in the group of how to perhaps do a bit better next mm -hmm. time? And what did that failure stroke lesson teach you about yourself? Mm -hmm. And how would you then do that differently next time? And I think if that can be a practice, even in project teams for part of the agenda, I think we become more used to talking about that. I, I hear what, what you say Stephen Bartlett's done is, is actually got a head of failure. I think if it becomes part of the culture mm -hmm. and it becomes part of business growth, if we can connect it to business growth rather than business failure, that's the key aspect. But it needs to be modelled from the top. Yeah, and I think actually what, what I've touched on what you just said then, I think is the key to it though. Is the key to it is that you go... What did we learn from that? And if you can analyse what we learned from that failure, then you can grow. Because there's it, it, it's no point in just going, oh, I'm failing and failing, and not understanding why you failed or taking any lessons from that, is it? You don't want to go down that route. But it's exactly what you just said, I think, is to. What, what have you failed at? What did you learn from that experience? How will we do that differently? And that's, the, that's definitely the, the key to that, that narrative, I guess, that we need to. We need to, and like you said, I think openly, like talking about it on on here, talking about it in at networking events, talking about it in. Uh, oh, like, I failed at this this week, for example. That, it, but not seeing that as a negative element to it, I think that's that's such a, and it's only by the, talking about it more, I guess, that we help to change the narrative, isn't it? Yeah, be more open, lead by example. Yeah. The flip side to that, I really want to touch on what you mentioned there about fear of success talk to me a little bit about that so i feared success even though there's some very successful people across my family extended mm. family but because i'd never really uh, experienced it in my own family that feeling of success that feeling of really having my act getting my act together mm. both in our personal lives when we were children but also financially, you know, I remember my dad, when he earned money, he'd say, come kids, let's go out and, you know, almost blow it, yeah. you know, and then there'd be like, you know, it would either be feast or famine. Mm. So it's also these money stories that we tell ourselves that are part of, of success. And mm. I think having a healthy relationship with abundance and, and money is part of that. But furious success, I think, has got a lot of elements to it. It has got the self-awareness angle. It is all about what you are clear about in terms of what you want, what success means to you. But also, if you do then fail, going back to what we said, does that detract from your success? So what is the whole broader definition of success? And I think some people have got a very narrow, and, and certainly myself in the past, view of success. If I make X, I'm successful. If I don't, I'm a failure. So I think we need to broaden that success into many different quadrants in our life, taking into account all the spheres that are important to us, our home, our lives, our, our hobbies, our mindfulness, our extended family in a circle, etc., cetera, et cetera. And I think that that fear of success is something that we all grapple with as globalization, technology, social media takes such a huge hold on us in life because that comparison mm -hmm. which is also one of the self-sabotage habits that comparing yourself even without realizing it mm -hmm. can damage your success and create a fear of success so it's actually checking in with yourself very regularly mm -hmm. around what success is and and really understanding that we all have a fear probably mm -hmm. of success but that we all are very very capable of reaching success in our own life, but that's going to be different to somebody else. You've touched on something there, really, that I find fascinating. I guess one of the essences of the, the, the tagline is helping the world to see success differently, because I think, as you alluded to there, so much, actually, in society and everyone, that our measurement of success is, like you said, I've earned X, or it's based on a financial status, isn't it? If any business, if they're, oh, they're successful because they turn over 100 million or they do this, da, da, da. it's all based around the financial status. Whereas there are so many different elements of success. Like I would I, I, I would say that um, potentially the, 
unsuccessful financially, yet relationships are hugely successful. I've, I'm, and and so much of this comes to my my something I've shared on here a few times around when I when I turned forty, I went through a really tough time, and because I my my measurement of success was based around a financial kind. I wanted to be a millionaire. I was the furthest away at 40 to becoming a millionaire than I've ever been. And yet, and I went into a really, really dark place. And what got me out of that was my narrative around success. I thought, if I died tomorrow, I was surrounded by people who loved me. And I was like, actually, my me- if I measured my success by the, the love that I was surrounded by, the people who loved me, I experienced love in all its forms, then, wow, I could die and be a very, very successful person. But I want them to be on a financial status. I think what you're touched on there is actually, and this is where I, I I grapple with the the fear of abundant success. I don't know why that eludes me a little bit. I've got an unhealthy relationship with that. And I wonder what skills you you've developed to, or you coach people on how they achieve that or they get over that side of it I do think listening to what you were just saying now it is a balanced view of what success is and it's not just the financial but it could be other important areas of one's life that make up that feeling of success Mm -hmm. and that's why in the book I have created a waves of work wheel Mm -hmm. and a waves of home wheel Mm -hmm to try and encourage people to look at each area of their life and embrace the good things and measure their progress Mm. so that they're not just looking at one aspect. It could be that their relationships are really poor, but their financial success is brilliant. Mm. So what do they need to work on in their relationships Mm. to actually almost encourage other people to be more successful, but also to have those ethics that other people want to support them in their business. And I think the practical tools are exactly what the book subscribes, which I found has become my blueprint, is everything that we go through in life, we need to go back to what is the clarity? What do I need to release in my life? How am I not having empathy for myself? What habits do I have at the moment which are not serving me? How am I not trusting myself? So the crest Mm. uh, of our lives and realizing that we are probably all going to go back to one of those elements at any time in Mm. terms of our success journey and that in terms of practical tips, it's our daily routines, our daily habits, our daily mindfulness that is going to help us be very honest about where we are at and our blind spots about success, which we all have, and we are all worried often about how we are perceived and making sure that our lives are a success. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we really become clear on what success means for us, and I do have lots of visualizations in the book, and one of them is about success and what your unique success means to you. And if you can train your brain, it's almost like visualization trains your brain to feel that they've already been there even though practically perhaps you haven't Mm. you then become better at at actioning those success principles in your life Um, it's really interesting I think visualisation is something I'd love to tap into as well because I can talk uh, I've interviewed, I've been fortunate enough to interview some Olympic champions uh, uh, like Sally Gunnell for example who come on and they talk very much about you know visualization visualizing standing on that that podium with that gold medal and what what that sort of said but i guess one thing i'd like to just delve into a little bit with that is setting goals and visualizing and getting to that point how do we how do we check in with ourselves to make sure that we're not delaying our happiness till we get to that goal because that's that that is what I I, I I struggle. But listening to people I've interviewed in the past is that actually we can, can't we? We can we can 
especially in business, we set ourselves so many goals. Like, okay, I'm going to get to this point, and then when you get to that point, that will move, and you're going to get to another point. And it's always going to be so. How do we? What advice would you give to someone or coach someone on the basis of? It's great to visualise where you want to go and set that goal, but it's the importance of the journey to get there, being present in that journey and appreciating that that part of it, I guess, and not delaying our happiness until we get to that, that point. Yeah, you're so right because it's that gap analysis mm. that makes us strive and always feel never good enough, mm. that, we've never, that we haven't achieved it yet, that when we achieve it, we'll be happier, more successful. And that gap between ourselves, who might not ever win a gold medal, but we're still just as deserving of being on our own podium although we can learn so much from top athletes in terms of mindset and visualization and how many of them have brought themselves from you know, tough childhoods, tough mm-hmm. lives, to, yeah. to actually pushing themselves and achieving and enduring and then achieving their own goals. But remember that each and every one of us has got a different goal, but I do think that what I would encourage people to do is not just look at their five-year plan or their one-year plan, but actually when you're lying in bed in the morning and you've just woken up, have gratitude, so you know, stack up at least 10, 15 things that you're grateful for as you're wiggling your toes and trying to you know, just, just become present, and then... In terms of visualization, imagine your day. Imagine how you're going to react today, how you're going to be towards others, what you want to get out of your day, who you're going to be with, and how do you want to feel at the end of the day. So I think that success is what exactly what you said. It's about those little journeys, little small things, that, that small steps is what I'm trying to say mm-hmm. along the way. But if we're constantly saying that we're not good enough, then we need to increase our gratitude. So at the end of the day then, either journal or have a gratitude practice. Sometimes I would just um, dictate that into my phone because I find speaking for me is is better. Mm -hmm. Other people, it's journaling. Other people, it's meditation. But I think it's each and every day having gratitude for how far you've come. What have I learned today? Where could I maybe do better? But how have I also helped somebody else along the way? And I think... I think then we're starting to just build layers of success and the end result doesn't become so important anymore because mm. we're already feeling a success along the way. Oh, that's a brilliant way of looking. Yeah, because a couple of things again, but small steps. Looking when you, when you put your visualisation at the top of that podium, that Mount Everest can seem like such a huge I agree. destination, can't it? Whereas if you... I guess if you if you go, uh, that's the mountain, but I'm just going to take that first step. I'm just going to go that first step up, and that small incremental win. And actually, take. I think one one thing I remember speaking to Sally about is not actually appreciating something I got from the book as well, which I found really great. Is that actually appreciating those small wins, celebrating those small wins on the way, as you just sort of mentioned there, is such a key thing because we don't because we've got that visualization in our head of oh, i'm gonna get there you don't all the hard work and all the little wins on the way you don't tend to we don't take a step back and and celebrate those as, as much as we should do. i agree sam i think there are two aspects to that and that is that i used to also feel so dissatisfied with myself because i hadn't yet reached that level of happiness and success that i wanted because i always saw the gap rather than where I was at and how much I'd actually learned along the way and those little steps where I was starting to progress really well in all areas of my life to make sure that I had work-life balance and kept my mental health Mm. good, which is such a treasure, isn't it, once you reach that, that healthy stage. But what I also falsely thought is that I wouldn't fear that success and I thought that if I reached that level of confidence and mindfulness and suddenly I had to go I don't know live on on LinkedIn or speak to a a few hundred people on an audience that I wouldn't Mm. feel a sense of nervousness or or fear Mm. of course you do that's part of the human element Mm. but it's actually practicing and I do have various mindfulness tools that I teach my clients of like 
what what is it, the process that you would allow your brain to to feel in moments like that and that you will always feel uncomfortable as you're progressing along your journey and discomfort and failure as we've discussed mm-hmm. lessons are part of the journey and so if we can become more comfortable with feeling a bit uncomfortable mm-hmm. And get ourselves into that place where it's not always going to feel safe. But that's okay too, because we're learning. I think it makes a difference. Yeah, I completely agree. I've just, the episode that came out um, this week, came out yesterday, was uh, with Paula Reed, who's the adventure psychologist. Um, an incredible woman. I mean, she talks very much like that around the, the comfort zone and your stretch zone and your panic zone and how much it's so much better to spend as much time as we can in that stretch zone because there's going to be some fear and anxiety in there and all of those things but there's you know there's joy and there's happiness and there's all of the things that come with that in that stretch zone um but it is feeling that little bit uncomfortable whereas if we she asked me i'd be interested to ask you this question what 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 percentage of our lives do you think we should spend in our comfort zone this was one of the questions we sort of spoke about (sighs) Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, I can only speak for myself personally. I would say less and less as I grow as both a person and an an entrepreneur. It's going to be a a small percentage as opposed to the level of discomfort that I am currently in as I grow and learn not only about myself, but just Mm -hmm. about life and and my place within life and, and my journey. And, yeah, I think... Feeling safe is is lovely, but when you really analyse yourself, you're not growing, you're not learning. Yeah, because you're right. That that's where that's where growth happens, isn't it? As soon as you step out of that that comfort zone part, that's where that's where our real growth and our real growth happens. Um, I, I want to look at. I know you mentioned obviously with the visualisation side, yeah, the other bit, and you sort of mentioned a little bit further back about about accountability how, how key is that in our journey being accountable for where for our own actions i guess and our own our own beliefs our own sabotage all of those things what, what talk to me a bit about that being a victim is a lovely place to be because everybody else is wrong <laughs> 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 yeah they all toxic and you know yeah, we need yeah. to get rid of them etc cetera, etc cetera. and it it I found the accountability part really hit home to me when I was re- writing the book mm. because I realized then how important it is actually for each and every one of us to take ownership for the patterns and behaviors, no matter what caused them, mm. but the impact of those patterns and behaviors on our own lives yeah. and how they've impacted our success. And I think when you take accountability, it's to take it without shame or blame and feeling bad about yourself or feeling a worse person. It's actually just saying, you know what, I do take accountability for everything I've been through because I think taking accountability gives you a certain level of control, Mm. saying I can actually make it different next time. I can actually grow and learn because I've looked at myself straight in the eyes and I understand where I've gone wrong perhaps in the past or where I could really shine my light further in the world and I find taking accountability sometimes I find myself kind of blaming something blaming somebody else and I have to stop myself in my tracks and take that accountability take a deep breath but it doesn't mean you're a bad person I think accountability makes you a lot more adult Mm. in your relationship with yourself and mature to know that you can control whatever it is you decide to absorb in your life and act on because that, for, for me, that's it. it's, it's actually an easier path, isn't it, to go, oh, it's that person's fault. I'm not here because of that person. Or I'm not here because, oh, this didn't work out because of X, Y, and Z. And actually, the key there is exactly that. It is, and so I've listened to a lot of, like, especially on the high performance podcast, a lot of people talk about, a lot of athletes on there, a lot of professional athletes, and they talk about the key like, to just being accountable for where you are. And it's your responsibility to to get that to that next step and to achieve that. But you can only do that by being accountable for and looking at looking at yourself. And again, back to I guess back to that self awareness piece, right? From a, being accountable, you've got to be able to be a little bit self aware, I guess. Yeah, I think it's very difficult to be accountable if you haven't done the self awareness yeah. piece and the empathy piece. Yeah, yeah. 
which is why the book does it, it, is, it does lead you on a voyage, right? It does lead us, on it, which is fantastic. But look, we're cu- coming towards the end of that, the, the, the empowering piece and the power model, I really like, from principles, objectives, work, energy and relationships. To talk us through Talk us through that. Yeah, so principles is what we've touched on. So your mm. principles and your values, what's mm. so important to you. And that you can tackle when you start to become more clear of yourself mm. and, and what's important to you in your life, which is going to be different to somebody else. Mm. And then, and obviously with the pattern, and obviously your objectives, your work, energy, relationship, all of those things is, I guess, in the empowerment of yourself. I guess that's what I really want to, I want to delve into a little bit more, I guess, about how, how do we get to that point where we we feel empowered and we, you know, and, and again, back to that self-talk, I guess, that the, the message that we, we're telling ourselves. Yeah, so going back to the power, power model, so values and what's important to you, your principles, and then your objectives. We spoke earlier about not just having your long-term objectives, but having short-term objectives Mm. that are more balanced in all areas of your life that are important to you. And then checking in on those objectives, Mm. seeing how you really are doing, but not feeling you have to have objectives all the time in every minute of the day. There's some moments of stillness that need to take place too. Mm. Taking the feedback and also making sure that you keep people close to you that give you objective feedback, being able to give feedback to others. Mm is also important. And then putting putting energy into to what you do as well, working hard and putting energy into what you believe in. Because if you're not working towards your goals or putting that real positive energy into it, you're just going to flail on the sidelines. Your ship isn't really going to go further. It's just going to be bobbed about on the waves of life. So it's not to say you have to constantly be achieving these big goals, but it is meaning that you know what direction you're moving in. Mm. And relationships, of course, are the key. It's something you said you're so good at, and and I'm so happy about that because I think unless we can nurture others, be nurtured by others, and feel valued by others, but, but not need that valuation, but actually just feel valued because of our own sense of self acceptance, that's are part of the power model really will propel us forward. Mm. And then account uh, empowerment as a whole is really the amalgamation of all the aspects that you've worked on so that you feel energized. You, you've got a good sense of where you are. You know what your strengths are. You know where you're heading in your life, but you know that you'll probably adjust those along the way. You're going to learn lots of things along the way. You're going to probably fail at many things along the way but having a balanced view of that and being prepared to adjust depending on what, what you go through in your life. Mm. And then using that as a model to move forward with, with grace and ease, but also empathy and joy mm. towards your goals, I think is so important. So that sort of cl- clarity, release, empathy, removing the self-sabotage habit, trusting yourself no matter what, happens in your life, then your well-being. So remember I mentioned, you know, the well-being wheels Mm. and making sure you check in with those. The accountability, the thing that I sometimes struggle the most with of having to like really look myself in the eyes and realize I've been accountable for those. (laughs) Then the visualization, which might not be long meditations, but it's actually visualizing success uh, leading to what you asked me earlier. That is what empowerment is once you're clear on that you can start to empower yourself along the way. Amazing. Mate, oh, it's, been, it's been such a joy chatting to you and, and delving in. Like I said, I've really enjoyed the book and it does, like I say, it, it almost takes your hand and leads you through a, through a journey, and which is, which is amazing. And it was, uh, I think, definitely from, like I say, f- from a personal point of view, it's... I'm going to go back through it again and I want to even practice some because it's great that you obviously give little tips in there as well and actionable tips that you can go right, go away and do this and go away and do this and start doing. And because it does, it, it, I think for anyone reading it will can hold a mirror up to you and have a little look and just ask you some of the questions that we're actually probably a little bit scared to ask ourselves, which is, uh, 
and make us feel uncomfortable. But again, back to that comfort zone bit. If I feel uncomfortable, then it's an area of growth for me, I guess. And that's that's something certainly I took from it, which is... Thank you. I wanted to make sure that the book dealt with discomfort Mm. and took each person on a journey as if I was in the room with them, talking to them, holding their hand, guiding them. Because I think it's a very lonely place when when we know that we want to grow in certain areas. And we, we want to know that somebody's with us, guiding us, cheerleading us. But at the end of the day, the responsibility of whether we want to change or not is always going to be ours. So we need that freedom. Mm. But in each chapter, knowing that there's some delving questions that you may need to return to, it's, mm. you may not get that immediately. It may take time. But don't be afraid to return to those parts of ourselves that most need work. Because mm. once we shine a light on that, and embrace that discomfort, it just becomes easier Mm. to accept ourselves fully. And accepting ourselves, I think, is one of the keys towards success. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I I, I agree. I agree. And I guess for you as well, like even being able to... Is there parts on where where you are on your journey? Is there parts in there that you still go back to and you'll still look at? And I guess it's it's, it's just a constant analysis, isn't it, of, uh, of... of ourselves to continue in that growth path. Yeah, I do find the release chapter, the release aspect is something I sometimes need to go back to. Just releasing those versions of myself Mm. that I've had for so long, Mm. especially when I'm in contact with perhaps parents who I love dearly but who are still enacting those possibly self-sabotage patterns Mm. Um, just to be kind to myself in those moments to be kind to them because they're on their own journey but also to start recognizing those patterns and feel that I don't have to carry that heavy load for everybody Mm. I can actually release that the release part I think the the accountability is something I go back to quite regularly but not with a stick just with a gentle Mm guiding light to myself to to make sure that I feel that I can take accountability for everything. It's, it's really empowering. And then the empowerment of recognizing that it all fits together yeah. and, and starting to become aware when something's out of sync, revisiting any of those aspects within myself mm-hmm. and just giving that a little bit more attention mm-hmm. as I embrace my own journey. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Look, this is where... Just as we're rounding off, I wanted to, I, I, I do our conversation cards, a lot of our events and stuff, and there's some of the things that come out, and one um, come out recently, I've been asking quite a lot, um, and especially to you, I guess, with so many lessons that you've got in the book, and so many lessons that we've learned from today, and, and our conversation, but if you was on your deathbed, and you could leave one lesson for someone, what would that be, and why? Be kind to yourself. Why? Because that will help you navigate a lot of storms in your life. Mm. Okay. It's been so fascinating, Chanchi. I'm really grateful for your time and coming on and, and for writing that amazing book and something I will go back to many times, I'm sure, and I encourage our listeners as well to, to pick up a copy and, and, and read it and hopefully um, you can guide them as you are me on their voyage to success as well. So... Thank you very much for your time. It's been amazing. Thanks so much, Sam. It's been such a deep and insightful discussion. I've absolutely loved it. Amazing. And that, as they say, is a wrap. (laughs) 